Good morning, good morning, good morning, church family. How you guys doing this morning? All right, that's okay, that's okay. It's wake up time, wake up time, okay. So right now we're going to encourage you guys to go around, walk around, meet a few people. We're so glad you guys are here. I'm looking at all the smiley faces. It excites me to be in the house of the Lord this morning to worship Jesus, to go out and take a few minutes, meet somebody you don't know, maybe grab a phone number, shoot a quick text message, get to know somebody. Thank you guys. All right, all right, all right, all right. Good morning. Okay, go ahead and find your seat. Listen, we're just so happy and glad that you are able to walk around and talk to people. It's so good to see the community of God coming together, just kind of sharing stories and all that good fun stuff. So thank you so much for being here. If you're online today watching, we want to tell you we welcome you. We're so glad that you are tuning in with us this morning. Please, please, please let us know you are watching by shooting a quick message for us. That way we can fill you in on what is happening. If this is your first time, reach your raise your hand for me. First time here at church today. First time. Come on. Come on. Give me a hand clap, you guys. So good. So good. Please text Seatman Guest to 84576 and you're asking why. We want to know more about you. We want to walk and do life with you. 
any way that we possibly can. So please do that for us. Or stop by the information center and get that stuff filled out. Because relationship is the only thing you take with you to eternity. That is right. We are all about building relationships here. And we can't wait to get to know you better. And Eddie, what else do we have going on here? We have divorce care. Here it is. 630 every Wednesday night. There's a place for you. Last day to join is April 13th. Flyers are available at the Information Center. Secondly, Pure Desire, okay? There's a misconception of what Pure Desire is. If you have struggled with anything at all, anything, okay? Please, please come to this group. Let us know what you're going through. We'd love to walk and do life with you as well. Because how many of you guys know you can't do life alone? You have to do it with somebody. And that place is the place where you can come and share your heart and share what you're going through. That's right. And where are all the parents of grade schoolers at? From kindergarten through fifth grade, I know you're here. You're probably dropping them off right now. That's probably where you are. But we have a parents' night out coming up on April 22nd. We can't wait to hang out with your kiddos. There's going to be pizza. There's going to be a Jesus word. There's going to be so much fun. And it's an awesome time for you to get out, go on a date night, and drop the kiddos here in a safe place where you know that they are loved and taken care of. So make sure to sign up, reserve your spot online or at the information center. Y'all know you need date night. Come on now, I heard some excuses. We have committee kids, there's so much stuff going on. Drop those kids off, you guys, please, to get here, okay? All right, all the guys say woo. Come on. All the guys say woo. There we go. Men's breakfast right around the corner. It is making its appearance April 30th, 11 o'clock. Bring your muscles, okay? Bring your attitude, bring your personality, and bring your belly that is empty so we can feed you and make sure that we get to know you as well. That's right, guys. Make sure you bring your muscles so that you can eat, okay? That is a requirement. Good job, Eddie. I like that. That's right. We are going to celebrate Good Friday here at Church for All Nations. This has come up so fast. Can you guys believe that it's Palm Sunday? Can you believe that resurrection is coming right around the corner? We can't wait to celebrate not only Good Friday, but Resurrection Sunday right here with you guys. And there's going to be a candy hunt and lots of fun for the kids following our morning sermon. All right. It is now time for worship something we've been doing all morning by talking with each other, lifting up the name of Jesus, getting into your word. Some of y'all this morning was in your word, and the Lord spoke to you by something. I'm going to invite you guys up to just go ahead and stand up for me. Some worship time. Young people, middle people, please come on up to the front. Join us for some worship, and I'm going to go ahead and pray and ask God to move supernaturally in this place. So, Father God, we thank you, Jesus, for who you are, Lord. God, we thank you that we can come to this place today with our brokenness, God, Lord, our spite, Lord, everything about us, God, that may not line up with you. Jesus, we can bring it to the cross. Father, we pray that you would accept our worship today, God. We thank you for again for what you're going to do, Lord Jesus. We're, we're in expectation, God, of the move that is about to happen. So Holy Spirit, do your thing. We love you, God, and we thank you, God, that you first loved us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Bless the Lord, oh my God. Bless the Lord, the heavenly host. Bless the Lord, all you his angels. And let all the earth sing forth his praise. Come on and bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. Come 
Hosanna this morning to the king. Say, say, Hosanna. Come on, shout it out. Hosanna. God is our salvation. Amen. Well, this next song sings about our God reigning over all. And so, as they shouted out Hosanna and were crying out for a king, really what they didn't know what they are getting was a savior. Amen. And this one who, ru who rules and reigns forever, even over our life right now. So let's sing this song together and really think about what we're singing. Hallelujah. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, 
You're the king of my life Just tell him that Cause you reign above it all You reign above it all Over the universe And over every heart There is no higher name Jesus you reign Above it all out your life just to give us new life now from the lips of the forgiven here an anthem arise is Jesus your life yes he is just declare it cause you reign above it all you reign above it all and over the universe and over there is no higher name Jesus you reign above it all Let all the earth and end, the earth erupt in song Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one There is no higher name Jesus you reign above it all sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory enthroned on the highest praise you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory enthroned on the highest praise declare it. you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave, now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave, now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. Sing it again. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave, now seated alone. Enthroned on the highest praise You sent the darkness running Out of an empty grave Now seated alone in glory Enthroned on the highest praise Wish you reign above it all You reign above it all And over the universe And over every heart there is no higher name, Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name, Jesus, you reign. Sing it one more time. Because you reign above it all. You reign above it all And over the universe And over every heart There is no higher name Jesus, you reign above it all Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song Sing hallelujah Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one there is no higher name, Jesus, you reign above it all. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe some of you today feel like, God, you really reign above all these circumstances that are happening in my life in my mind, in my marriage, in my work, and he does. Sometimes he, he wants us to come to him like children, and when it feels like that, that weight is too heavy to bear, he doesn't want us to bear it. 
He wants us to come to him like children and to offer to him day after day after day, right? Every day if we have to. Just say, Jesus, I thank you. You reign above it all. I trust you. You're our salvation, Lord. You're our strength.
song and I do think the older you get the more that becomes real to you and we have a gentleman here today he's he's part of the family at Church for All Nations been around for a lot of years Bernard I'd like you to come up if you would can you come on up Bernard he's celebrated his 100th birthday yesterday 100 years and I know that's got to be your testimony I don't want anything else I don't need anything else give me Jesus I got a verse that I'd like to read and I'd like you to just something's on your heart to share with us let's turn them around so we can see them really well let's get them right up go right up here Bruno. okay yeah So this is the verse I'd like to read in Isaiah 46, 4. It says, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. And you know what that rescue means to me at the end of the day? He's got you covered. He's taking you home. That's not ready yet, man. You're a hundred and going strong. What would you like to share with everybody? Well, Jesus has blessed me and my family beyond reason. Uh, I'm 101 now. We have been married for 75 years. And my wife would be here, except she got out of the hospital a couple of weeks ago, and she's still recovering a little bit. But uh, everything I've done, the Lord has been with me. If I had an accident, I never had a scratch when I got out. And every, I was, except Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, March the 7th, 1973. And so I hear I am today. <laughs> what else can I say? <laughs> well, I just, I just learned this today that you even 
cook your own meals today. And I don't know, I don't even, I've never cooked a meal for myself, so I'm gonna have to learn something from you. Well, I make my own meals and take care of myself. Uh, even help my, my wife out occasionally. But uh, I've been, I've liked cooking all my life, so it just comes to me naturally. Well, we love you. We I thank you for being here, and I bless one Jesus to bless everybody to help, and that's all I can say. We're going to pray for you right now, Father. We thank you for Bernard and his his life. And even as this song we just sang, you can take the whole world, but give me Jesus. And may this testimony that everybody's seeing today be a witness of your faithfulness to, to all generations. And Lord, we just ask again, just thank you for his life. Thank you for his testimony. Thank you that he's part of the body of Christ. Uh, and so we just we just are grateful today that he's with us in our presence. And everybody said, amen. Hey, how about a happy birthday? Can anybody kind of lead? Oh, by the way, uh, I guess after, is it 90, you get a bag? And when you hit 100, you get a whole box of goodies. So I guess that's what you're getting. So let's do a quick happy birthday to you. Let's make it happen. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bernard. Happy birthday to you. Or it could have been, may God bless you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, that was awesome. <laughs> um, I just love his words. He just honored the Lord um, with his words, 100 and, 101 years old. Aren't you guys just thankful for the Lord? Amen. Wow. Um, you know, we're honoring God with our worship. And I was just thinking about just God sending his son. And we've heard it so many times. We hear it all the time. God sent his son. God sent his son. Lord, I don't want that to ever grow old in my ears, that you sent your son. And when we're under his covering, you guys, when we put ourselves under his covering, God never says it's going to be perfect. <laughs> How many of you guys know that? <laughs> it's never, it's never going to be perfect. But we have a hope in him. So when things are going wonderful, our hope is in him, and we thank him. When things are going bad, which they do, we have a hope in him. And so as, he, as the Lord blesses you guys, he blesses you with the talent to provide for yourselves, to provide for your families. And God doesn't say, you're going to honor me. He wants you to want to honor him with your wealth. And he says all over his word what he's going to do. And he says, guys, I just want your heart. So in that... Don't get caught up in what I've provided for you. Know where it came from. It came from me. And so in Proverbs it says, honor the Lord with your wealth. So guys, let's honor the Lord. Thank him for what he's given you today. He may have only given you a little. That's okay. Honor him with the little that you have. He may have given you a lot. Awesome. Praise God. Honor him with the much that he's given you. He didn't give that to you to hoard it. <laughs> that's, about, that's how you honor God. It's, don't, it's not all about you. So, Father, we just thank you for this day. Lord, I just pray that our minds are on you. Like that song said, we don't want anyone else. We don't want anything else. All we want is you. You are our one thing, Father. Help us to honor you, Lord, with everything in our lives, including the talents that you've given us, including how you've blessed us, whether that's with a little or with a lot, God. We just want to honor you because it all comes from you. Everything comes from you, Lord. So help us, Jesus. And we just thank you and we praise your holy name, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Everybody say it.
Amen. Oh, ways to give. <laughs> you can give online. You can text. And we got the offering buckets up front, you guys. So be blessed. Love you all. Just continue to worship with us this morning as we sing a song, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Even on that day that he came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and the people worshipped him and said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We're going to do that together today. Amen. Amen. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hallelujah. Hosanna.
in your presence I speak Jesus And, and several people from this body, a lot of the young people over there, we got to go on a missions trip over to South Africa. And I want to encourage you, God is doing something all over the world. All over the world, he is bringing his church together and it's to lift up the name of Jesus, to draw people to him. Yes, there are, are people that are broken. Yes, there are people that are hurting. Yes, there's wars going on and things are happening all around us. But I know one thing that never will change and that's that Jesus rules and reigns forever and ever and ever. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. God is my salvation. That's what that means. And I just encourage you this morning as we prepare our hearts for the word, even to kind of stir it up a little bit. You see, what the Jewish people missed when they cried it out, it's how in the world does a people cry out one week Hosanna, hail to this King, Jesus, the Messiah, and one week later cry out crucify him. It's because they didn't even know what they were crying out for. They were looking for someone to save them from their problem. But Jesus came to save their life completely, their heart. And see, I think so often sometimes we come to the altar, we come to church. Lord, get me out of this mess that so often sometimes we get ourselves into. Or just the way life goes, things happen. Difficult things happen in life. And I just want to encourage you this morning, we cry out Hosanna to the King to simply lay everything at his feet and say, Lord, my life is yours. You're the God of my salvation. That means everything, everything I need, I realize is in you and through you. And I just wanna encourage you this morning as we're preparing our hearts and whether you're in this room this morning or those that are watching online, as we pray in just one second, really open up your heart. Say, Holy Spirit, search my heart out. See if there's anything in me that is not of you. Cleanse it. Make me holy, Lord, as you are holy. 
And that's only through the blood of Jesus. And that's why he really came. So Father, we come to you this morning with our hearts open, our arms wide to you in surrender and saying, Lord, fill us up. Do what you want to do in me this morning, Holy Spirit. Let my heart be soft. God, give me such a boldness for you that I'm going to shout out from the mountains, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, it's simply doing the Great Commission. And you've called each one of us to do that, whether we're overseas in South Africa, whether we're in our neighborhood, whether we're in our school, our workplace. Father, I pray that we're people that are obedient to you. So, Lord, we give your heart this morning. Have your way in us. Have your way in us. Speak through Pastor Dave this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and tell someone hello and get your heart ready as we open up our hearts for the word of this morning. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, C fan. I was thinking about the younger generation. And then I was thinking about our brother who's 101 years old. That is so amazing. And you know what that speaks to you as the younger generation. And I love our younger generation. Amen? I love our younger generation is that God is faithful. And there we just heard it. 101 years old. And if I calculated it correctly, you gave your heart to the Lord about 50 years ago. Somewhere around that. God is faithful. Can we just say that? God is faithful. God is faithful. Well, it's always a privilege and an honor for me to be here at CFAN. I feel like I'm part of the family. My daughter Heidi goes here. My grandchildren are a part of this family. So again, thank you for the privilege and the honor of being here to be able to share with you God's Word this morning. A few years ago, my wife and I had the privilege uh, to take a trip with several other couples. And can you turn this down in the monitor just a little bit for me? Thank you. And I discovered something, and I want to show you a picture of it in just a minute. But I discovered something that maybe more than anything else in my life took the story of the resurrection and took the story of Christianity out of the romanticized fairy tale world of the Bible and brought it home into the 21st century. And so I want to show you that picture in just a moment. We actually went to Italy, and it happened to be over Kathy's birthday. And uh, this is kind of a big trip for us, and we had saved up for it. We, uh, as a part of our trip, we also spent several days on a cruise. And one of the ports that we landed at was a port called Chia Tavecchia. And from that particular port, We took an excursion to Rome, and there's so much to see in the city of Rome that you you could spend a month there and not see everything that there is to see. But one of the things that I wanted to see that was on my list, as would probably be on your list as well, was the Colosseum in Rome. Now, you've seen pictures of the Colosseum, and i got a couple of pictures I want to show you uh, of the Roman Colosseum, and maybe we could put that first picture up there if we have it. The Colosseum, the Colosseum was actually built in 70 A.D. by the Emperor Vespasian. It was finished in 80 A.D. and it took about eight years to build by his son Titus, who was then uh, the emperor. It's like 140 feet tall, and you can see the scale is pretty massive. Uh, it can seat, they say, up to 50,000 people. And as you can also see around the bottom there, that there are lots of entrances around the bottom. There are actually 76 entrances to get into, much, much like a modern stadium, much like a football stadium uh, that we would see today. There were 76 entrances, 72 of them were numbered which is kind of interesting. You know, you come up to the Colosseum in your chariot, you got your kids with you, and you get out, and you go, okay, kids, we're going to go in through gate 
50, so if we get lost, that's where we got to meet up, and that's where we got to come back out. Not sure how they did all that with the parking in the Coliseum. So anyway, they had that whole thing going on. But four of the gates were not numbered. The emperor's gate, where the emperor and his family would enter, and then directly across from the emperor's gate is the gladiator gate, where the gladiators would enter. And then there were two other gates that were for the VIPs that would attend. Now, it's interesting that when you go into the Colosseum, if you buy a ticket to go into the Colosseum and you walk around inside, one thing that you'll notice is that the floor of the Colosseum, and you may already know this, and I've got a couple of pictures I want to show you of that as well, if we could put those up there. It's, it's wooden, and you may know that. And underneath, in fact, if you could put that next picture up, I grabbed this from one of the guys that went on the trip. Underneath is, is the area where they had for animals and slaves and gladiators and, you know, I guess body parts. I'm not really sure what all they kept down there. But the floor was wooden with sand on top. And the Colosseum, the Roman Colosseum was used for almost 400 years, essentially as an arena for death. 400 years it was in use. Gladiators, you know, the games, we're all familiar with that. They used animals. They did executions, oftentimes in this arena. And again, and I'd like you to put that back up there and leave that up there for just a second for me. And again, the gladiators, they came from across the street on the other side through their entrance, and then the emperor through his entrance. So if you buy a ticket, that was what I was going to say, when you buy a ticket to visit the Colosseum, you actually enter through the emperor's gate. So you would buy a ticket, you would get in line just like you would, you know, if you went to Disneyland or Disney World, and you would walk into the Colosseum and you would walk under the arch where the emperor would enter into the Colosseum. Now, if you're like me, Um, you know, whenever you travel somewhere, you just read and read and read and learn everything you can. So I had all this information and I was all excited and we had a tour guide and, uh, you know, I thought, you know, I'm thinking I know more than he does, which was definitely not the case. But I just couldn't wait to share with everybody everything that I knew about the Colosseum and all this interesting information. But there was something that I was not prepared for. There was something that I discovered, and I'm going to show you in just a moment. It may have meant very little to you, but it meant so much to me. I mean, it was just one of those moments that it was just, for me, it was a life-changing moment for me personally. And here's the picture. If you could put that next picture up there. Here's Here's the picture I want to show you. Do we have that next picture? That picture right there. Now, what is that? Somebody tell me what that is. Yeah, it, it's a cross. A cross is hanging over the emperor's entrance to the Colosseum. And I want you to look at this picture for a moment because it's just amazing. You're coming into the Colosseum, this arena of death that was used for almost 400 years really to glorify the worst things about humanity, slavery, death, I mean just everything. You're walking in and there's this giant cross and everybody, and if you could put that next picture up, I have one more picture I want to show you. Right there. And you can see it in the middle of the Colosseum there. If you could just leave that picture up for me for a few moments. Everybody that comes into the Colosseum actually walks underneath this particular cross. And again, on the opposite side is another cross. It's over the gladiator entrance to the Colosseum as well. Now, I was so blown away by this, and I'll tell you why in just a second. But I did some research, and I discovered that these crosses were actually placed there in the Roman Colosseum by a pope, Pope Benedict the Fourteenth, sometime around in the 1700s, he put those crosses there. And the reason that the Pope put those there is he dedicated this Colosseum, this arena of death, where everything, I mean, everything just disgusting uh, that happened in association with this arena, 
but he dedicated the Roman Colosseum to the Christian martyrs who died under Roman rule. Because during the time of the Roman Empire, there were several periods of persecution against Christians. We know about Nero. We know about that whole thing that happened before the Colosseum was ever built. There were several widespread and local persecutions of, against Christians during that time under Roman rule. And so the Pope decided to dedicate the entire Colosseum to the memory of these Christians that had lost their lives in Rome. Not all over the world, but just in the vicinity of the area that we would consider to be Italy. And he dedicated to them. It's one of my favorite pictures. I love looking at this particular picture. And I want to tell you why this meant so much to me. It just sort of just stopped me in my tracks. I want you to come back in time with me for just a moment. I want you to somehow, if you can, to use your imagination with me, and this may be difficult for us to imagine, but if you could somehow imagine going back in time 2,000 years ago when this Colosseum, and if we could put that back up there, I want to leave, I want to leave that picture up there. I want everybody to look at that picture. If we could just go back in time, or maybe even a little less than 2,000 years ago, when right in the middle of all of this, all this stuff was going on. All this stuff was happening. And if somehow we were able to gather together a group of people, and here's the group that we would gather, what if, what if we were able to gather the slaves that worked in the darkness and in the shadows of the Colosseum to go out and, you know, drag dead, dead bodies and body parts and the carcasses of animals out of the sand? What if we were able to gather some of those? And what if we were able to gather some of the parents of the men and women who were crucified by Nero just down the street in his circus? He actually had another arena, not this particular one, but Nero actually had another arena. They called it the circus. It was an oblong arena, it, you know, without a roof. It didn't have a roof. And if you've seen, uh, you know, Ben-Hur, you saw that chariot race, it was that kind of facility. He actually had his own uh, circus, his own arena where he did his official execution of Christians. He crucified Christians there as well. They were fed to the lions there as well. You know, that, that whole thing that we're familiar with. What if what if we could gather together some of the parents of the relatives of some of the people that lost their brothers and lost their sisters and lost their uncles and their aunts under Nero? Gather them together with the slaves. And what if we could also gather together the Christians that lived in Rome during the time that the arena, this arena right here, the Colosseum, was used to celebrate blood and gut and execution. Many of them were Christians. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians during this 400 year period. Thousands of Christians lived in the shadows of the Colosseum and lived in fear lest they be discovered. What if what if we could go back 2,000 years ago and gather together that group of people together and what if we were to say to them Someday, someday they will hang in the entrance of this arena of death a cross. A cross that does not reflect or represent the power of Rome. A, a cross that does not reflect or represent the anger and the death associated with crucifixion. Someday a single cross will hang in the emperor's entrance to the Colosseum of Rome. A cross that will represent one single crucifixion of a Jewish carpenter 1,500 and some miles away who never traveled more than 25 miles from his home, was basically a public figure for three years, betrayed by his own people and executed by the Roman authorities, but whose message impacted the entire world, even the city of Rome. And long after there was a Roman empire, people would worship and celebrate this one Jewish carpenter. 
One day, his name would be so big and his power felt in so many places in the world that someone would choose to hang a cross that does not represent Rome or even crucifixion in general, but it represents one single crucifixion. And it's a reminder of who, he's, who he was, his message, his death, and his resurrection. What if we were to say to them, Someday, someday, there will be tens of millions of people who worship and place their faith in this Jewish carpenter that Rome crucified. And that over time, the Roman cross will no longer even symbolize anything to do with Rome. It will come to symbolize one single crucifixion and this one single figure. What if we were to say to them, years from now, every year in the winter, people will gather together and tell a story. And in that story, the emperor, Augustus Caesar, will be mentioned. But the story will not be about him. He will simply be a footnote in the story of a Jewish carpenter. And he is a footnote in the story of the birth of this Jewish carpenter who would eventually change the world. What if... We were to say to them, someday, someday people will come to this city and they will not ask, where did the emperors live? They will come to this city and they will not ask, where are the emperors buried? They will come to this city and they will walk through the ruins of the Roman Senate and they will ask questions like this, who is the Apostle Paul? Who is the Apostle Paul? Where was he imprisoned? And you look at me and you, you, you say, well, who is the Apostle Paul? Well, he's just another Jewish man from 1,500 miles away who took the message of this crucified man from Nazareth and took his message around the world. And he will become so famous and was so famous in his lifetime that the Romans arrested him. And once again, he was actually brought to Rome and beheaded. And there is more known about the Apostle Paul than most of the Roman emperors all put together. Someday, someday people will come to this city and they will visit a building that is so magnificent that it dwarfs the magnificence of anything built by the Roman emperors. It's called the Basilica of St. Peter. Dale, do you remember when we stood in that building? It is just the massiveness of that building. And if you think the Colosseum is something worth seeing, the Basilica of St. Peter, St. Peter seats 600,000, or excuse me, 60,000 people, and it was built in honor of a Jewish fisherman who followed the crucified carpenter who became the leader in what would one day be called the church. And even though he never ventured to Rome until the end of his life, he had no political influence. He did not write a book. He never raised an army. He was of such influence that at his death, eventually his followers would spend, this is just amazing to me, his followers would spend over a hundred years building a cathedral in his honor. And more people will visit this city and visit where he was buried than all the Roman emperors put together. And not only that, you would be able to say to them, and you will never believe where this basilica, this cathedral to St. Peter was built. They built it on the very site of Nero's Roman circus. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Christians were systematically put to death, many of them crucified on that very piece of real estate. That building will be built to the glory of a Savior in memory of his number one follower, the Apostle Peter. What if, what if we were to say to them, someday, countless people, countless people will wear crosses around their necks. They will decorate the buildings with crosses. And these crosses will not come to reflect the multitude of crucifixions that took place in those 400 years. They will only reflect and they will only be a symbol of one single crucifixion 
the crucifixion of a man they called Jesus. Now let me just ask you, would they have believed you? No. No. They would have looked at you and said, oh, no, 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 no. Stranger, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Rome is forever. The Roman Empire is forever. A a Jewish carpenter? Are you kidding me? A Jewish carpenter? A single crucifixion changed the meaning of crucifixion for an entire world? Are you kidding me? Galilee? Judea? What has ever come from Galilee? What has ever come from Judea? They're under the heel of Rome. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you've been, but I'm telling you, this is never, ever going to happen. And yet today, if you visit the Colosseum, there is a cross that represents one single crucifixion hanging in the gateway to the Colosseum. And as I stood there in that Colosseum with Kathy, my wife, she'll tell you this, it was extraordinarily emotional for me personally. Let me tell you another reason why. You see, when you were in high school or when you were in college, at some point in most of our lives in an ancient history class, somebody explained to us, usually in the course of about you know, 10 minutes, somebody explained to you the rise and the spread of Christianity. Somebody in a chapter, in a textbook, you know, in a lecture explained just as they went through the course of ancient history that Christianity appeared and Christianity spread. And in some kind of secular, you know, non-religious, non-supernatural way, they tried to explain to you why it was that Christianity spread the way it did. And basically how it was that a peasant carpenter in the course of three years so galvanized the following of people that even after he became an outcast from the Jews and was executed by the Roman authorities that his message spread all around the world and outlasted the Roman Empire. And the problem is, is that even if you read books, and there's lots of books on this, there's lots of, you know, articles on this, there's lots of, lots of information on this, but when you read the explanation, the explanations just don't make sense. How do you explain the fact that a cross hangs in the entrance of the Roman Colosseum? A cross that doesn't represent crucifixions, but one single crucifixion. How in the world, how is it that Jesus, think about this, how is it that Jesus in the course of three years shared a message that was so, you know, vanilla, that was so unextraordinary, except in maybe one particular case, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that never got basically outside the realm in which he lived and traveled, which just wasn't very far because he traveled by foot most of the time. A man who the leaders of his day in his own Jewish community said was a traitor. A man who in his lifetime was condemned to crucifixion by the Romans. Crucifixion meant that you were worse than a slave. Crucifixion meant that you were worse than a a rebel. It was the most shameful, it was the most painful way to die. Why is it that his message lasted beyond his short life? And how is it that it spread around the world? And maybe here's something else you're not aware of, or maybe you don't know. A few years A few years after Jesus was crucified, and I say a few years, it was actually about 25 years after Jesus was crucified, something else happened in Palestine. Something else happened in Israel that gets almost no attention in our history when we're taught history. There was a four to six year war. It's called the Jewish War. It's very, very well documented. The Jewish Wars between Rome and the Jews The Jews had rebelled and rebelled and rebelled and finally several leaders came together and formed an army and they began to attack several cities that were held by Rome. They actually drove the Romans out. 
And eventually, Vespasian, who wasn't the emperor, he came at that time. He came with a 10th legion and started a war, not a battle. He started an actual war with the Jews. Again, it's called the Jewish Wars. Eventually, he went to Rome to become the emperor. And his son, Titus, General Titus, took over the 10th legion along with all of the other legions and decided once and for all, we're going to put this rebellion down. And friends, listen, the entire war culminated around the city of Jerusalem. And all around the city of Jerusalem, they crucified hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jewish people in order to try to scare them into submission. And eventually, after a long protracted battle, the city was taken by the Romans. And the Romans were so angry, they went into the city of Jerusalem. They eventually expelled the Jews from the city. And they went into the temple, this holy temple, and they leveled it. They destroyed it. They, they, just, they just raised it. Because they realized that the epicenter of all the energy... And all the fanaticism in the Jewish, cult, uh, Jewish culture was around the temple. This is where their God lived. This is where their God was. And they went in there and they destroyed the temple. And on August the 6th, 70 AD, the last temple sacrifice was made. And when Titus took the city, and when Titus took the temple... That was the end of ancient Judaism as ancient Judaism was known. You can read the history of the Jews and you will discover that the Jews left the city and they began a different brand of Judaism. But Judaism, as it was described in the Mosaic Law, as it's described and we read about in the Old Testament, ended on August 6th, the year 70. Here's why this is so important. This is why this is so important. You see, the context for everything Jesus taught was the Old Testament. He came as the Lamb of God. He came as the Lamb of God. Well, why is that significant? Because he, the Lamb was the sacrificial Lamb. And all the Jewish people, and all those who ascribe to Judaism, even the non-Jewish people understood that God would one day send a lamb. Jesus constantly talked about the law, the law of Moses. He talked about the temple. Everything Jesus taught, his, the entire context for Jesus' ministry, the entire context for Jesus' message was the Old Testament and the sacrificial system as typified by what happened in the temple. When the temple was destroyed when ancient Judaism came to an end. The context for everything Jesus had to say vanished in the course of a few days. Why in the world, why did his message get out of the first century? Why is it that we know the name of Jesus today? How did it ever get out of the first century? Why would anyone follow someone who claimed to be the Son of God. Well, which God would that be? Well, it would be the Jewish God. Oh, you mean, you, you mean the Jewish God that hovers around and lives in the temple in Jerusalem? Yeah, that, that very same God. You, you mean the one, you know, the, the temple that the Romans completely destroyed and it's never been rebuilt? You mean the God of the sacrificial system that the Romans put to an end and there's never been a sacrifice since? The, the, the son of that same God? Yeah, the son of that same God. Oh, well, that just, there's just loads of credibility around that story. Right? I'm telling you, when the temple went away, the context for Jesus' entire ministry went away. But today, there's a cross. In that picture that I had up there, there is a cross that hangs in the emperor's gate of the Roman Colosseum 
It is undeniable. But to try to explain all of that by simple, you know, humanistic understanding of history, when, when you read those stories, it just doesn't make sense. There were many, there were multiple leaders who rose up in Palestine who claimed to be Messiah. There were a multitude of teachers. Many of them raised money. Many of them raised armies. And every single time the leader was executed, the following just, just dissipated into the sands of Palestine. But not this time. Because there was something different about Jesus. And so 2,000 years later, His cross, His cross is what we think about when we think about crucifixion. See, here's why we're here today. Here's why that cross hangs in the Colosseum. Here's why the message in the person of Jesus did not evaporate like all of the other wannabe messiahs that, that arose during that same period of history. It was two simple things, but profound things. At the core of his message was a brand new kind of love. And at the core of his experience and his story was a crucifixion. It was a new kind of love that we'll talk about. And it was an undeniable resurrection. And the core message of unexplainable, unconditional love coupled with an event. What, what he did along with what he taught not just his crucifixion, because many, many people were crucified. But the message of his love, coupled with the historic, in history, in time, go see it for yourself, resurrection, is what catapulted thousands and thousands of people out of Jerusalem, in spite of what happened to their temple, in spite of their fear of Rome, into the world to let the world know that God has done something new that God has done something in the world. And again, as a result, today, in the Roman Colosseum, there hangs the cross of our Savior. So with all of that in mind, I want to read to you just a couple of verses this morning. And I'm praying, and if you want to follow along in your Bible, it's John chapter 13. But just a couple of verses, and I would love if we could just somehow hear these verses the way that his disciples heard them. Because this is so commonplace to us. And the reason it's so commonplace to us is because we've heard it so many times. Because what I'm about to read to you is actually, and you may disagree with this, is actually a part of American culture. The reason this is so uh, you know, whatever, you know, I've heard this before. The reason this is so ingrained into American culture is because Jesus said it, and eventually the people who founded our nation believed so much in the words of Jesus that this actually became an American value. It hasn't always been front and center, and we've struggled and struggled and struggled with it, just like the church at large has struggled with it. But over and over and over, we come back to this. Because this was the thing that set Jesus' teaching apart from every other teacher. And this one central tenet of his teaching, coupled with the fact that he rose from the dead, is what catapulted Christianity out of the first century. He gathered together, it's on the eve of his crucifixion, he gathered together with his closest followers. And this is what John records that Jesus said. In verse 34, he says, A new command I give you. And we read it and we think, well, that's not new. But see, it was new to them. And that little Greek word there, new, means strange. It can also be interpreted as unusual. He looks at these guys and he says, guys, a new command I give you. You've got 10 commandments and, you know, you've got 600 other commandments, you know, to support the 10 commandments or 600 laws. But he said, today, I give you a new command. Love one another. Love one another. 
as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Not as you've been loved by others, not the conditional love that you've experienced in other parts of your culture. You know, not, not the kind of love that's talked about in Greek literature and Roman literature. This is a different kind of love. Guys, you've got to love one another. And in that statement, and in the statements that would follow, Jesus did something that was so unusual that I'm sure it took them weeks, months, maybe the rest of their lives to really get their arms around that. What Jesus said in that moment, he said this, he said, every single person who is ever born has value. Every man, woman, and child has value. Rich, poor, male, female, slave, free. Every person has value. There are no qualifiers, guys. And I want you to love, love, love one another as I have loved you. Guys, I'm giving you a brand new standard. This is the great equalizer. I want you to love one another. And then this next part is the part that the church has forgotten over and over and over. And when the local church and when the universal church and when the international church continues, continues to come around this one simple idea, the church is strong, the church is central in culture, and the church changes culture. But when we lose this one simple ideal, when we begin to measure our spirituality and our relationship with God in other terms and in other things that we do, that's when we begin to drift. That's when we begin to move off center. And listen to what Jesus said in verse 35. He said, by this, by this, by this one thing, Pentecostals, that would be me. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, pretty much been a Pentecostal all my life, it's not your gifts. Baptists, it's not your church attendance. Presbyterians, it's not your knowledge. Catholics, it's not your consistency at Mass. By this, Jesus said, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you, what? Come on, say it again. What? If you love one another. The primary thing that would mark Christians in the first century was that they had this unusual, fanatical, selfless, sacrificial, you know, weird, you know, never seen it before kind of love for one another. And I'm telling you, outsiders, outsiders would come into their congregations and would come into their meetings when they would meet together and they would see slaves and they would see free men and they would see rich and they would see poor and they would see children and they would see ex-slaves there. They would see all kinds of people gathered together and when they gathered together there seemed to be an equality that wasn't force but an equality that was natural. Because in the first century and throughout history, if you study the church, throughout history, there has always been a thread of this unusual, strange kind of love where everyone was given value. And then Jesus would go on to say this. He would say, I want you to love your enemies because your enemies have value to your heavenly Father. And then Paul would come along with Peter and together they would write their epistles and they would say, men, love your wives. And the thing that we can't understand and the thing that is still just confusing to us as we look at what happens in other cultures around the world is that in this culture, in the first century, in this culture, women, women were just one notch above a slave. Women were traded like cattle. Women were treated with no respect. They had no rights. And along comes Paul and along comes Peter and they say, you know, as we have begun to live out this value that Jesus taught us years ago, we understand that men, wives are not your property. Men, your wives are as valuable to your heavenly Father as you are. Love your wives. Well, how much should we love them? Well, you just love them like your Savior loves you, and you should be willing to give your life for her. And in that moment, ladies, in that moment, through the teaching and through the teaching of the New Testament, the status 
of women was elevated to a place that he had never, ever been before and, and to a place that it still isn't in certain parts of our current world. See, when, when we hear about how women are treated in other cultures that are non-religious and non-Christian, and we just inside, we just say, well, I can't believe that people would treat women like that. I'm telling you, that was the norm until this brand new ethic of love was launched through the words of our Savior and through the teaching of those who followed Him. I'm telling you, what is normal to us was radical in the first century. And again, when people would walk in and they would meet with Christians, there was this value that they gave men and women and children. You know, in, in that story in the New Testament that, you know, we kind of read by and we're like, oh, well, you know, what's that all about? You know, where, you know, Jesus says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't, don't keep the children away from me. You, you let the children come to me. And they're all like, but, but you're a teacher. You're like, you know, you're like the Messiah. I mean, we, we've seen what you've done with those powerful, powerful hands. And Jesus says, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. If they're good enough to touch men, if they're good enough to heal the lepers, you send the children to me. And when he did that, he gave value to those who had little value. He gave rights and recognition to those who had no rights and oftentimes got no recognition. Listen, you know why? You know why it breaks your heart when you hear what happens to children in other parts of the world? Because there is a value that's so instilled inside of you. That's why. But it's not normal. It's not normal. We've been taught. This is a little bit of the thumbprint of this powerful, powerful, you know, radical message of love that Jesus taught. This was new. It was bold. It, it was amazing. And the reason it's so important for us this morning is because of this. There are things in our culture that you don't like. And there are some things in our culture that I don't like. And there are things in our culture that I would like to see changed, for sure. And some of you, if you had the freedom and you had a microphone, you would say, well, I, I, I just feel like America is no longer a Christian nation. And we need to do something. And so we vote, and we should vote. And we sign petitions, and there's a time to sign petitions, and there's a time to go to rallies, and there's a time to have signs. You know, all those things are a part of our American culture and a part of, you know, however, you know, we can bring about the change that we need. But I'm here to tell you this morning, I'll tell you what I know works. I'll tell you what I know changes culture. I'll tell you what I know would get the attention of a world that's so desperately needs that kind of value and this kind of understanding of human life. It's this radical, unusual, irrational, unconditional love for one another. And the reason I know it works is because there is a cross. Can you put that picture up there for me one more time? There is a cross hanging in the entrance to the Colosseum in Rome. And let me, let me just close with this. Honestly, I think the message, you know, as you think about the message of Jesus, historically speaking, should have died when he died. It, it should have died the day that he was crucified. But it didn't. Because three days later, there was an, a, an event that punctuated everything he taught. And it punctuated everything that he said about himself. There was an event that happened three days after his crucifixion that sent hundreds and hundreds of followers into the streets, into the very streets, into the very place where he was crucified. And it led them to the tomb where he was laid. They could have walked there. That's how close this was. And they went into the streets. And from the book of Acts, here is a summary of their message. Here's what Luke writes. <clears throat> Luke who wrote the book of Acts. Here's what he said. You killed the author of life 
but God raised him from the dead. Come on. <laughs> God raised him from the dead. Yeah. And we are witnesses of this. And so you know what they did? They went out and told their story and they loved each other like crazy. They went out and told what they had seen and they loved each other like crazy. They went out and they shared what they were witnesses of and they loved each other in an unusual way. And today, through the teachings of Jesus and then the disciples and then the church fathers and all the way here, that's why we're here today because of the love of Jesus and because of an undeniable resurrection that catapulted this message out of a context where it should have been buried once and for all. And while it's true that we have benefited from the architecture and the history of Rome, there's no question about that, what has been of greatest benefit to us was the death and the resurrection of a living Savior, a Savior whose cross hangs in a Roman Colosseum, a Savior whose cross is the symbol of suffering and shame, but not the suffering and shame of tens of thousands, but of one solitary man, a Savior whose cross hangs in a Colosseum, whose crucifixion and resurrection changed everything. And we're here today because of that. And we have hope. Regardless of what you think about your personal life or what's happening in culture, friends, we have hope. We have hope that things can change. We have hope that we can be a part of that change, whatever that means to you, whatever that looks like for you. Because we know that at the end of the day, if we will love one another, and we will continue to ascribe value to every person that we come in contact with. We know that God can radically change any culture. And the reason I believe that is because there is a cross that hangs in the Roman Colosseum. God bless you. Thank you. so much Pastor Dave the power in the cross first invitation this morning is for those that you've never accepted the Lord as your personal Savior you've heard about it you've heard the stories you understand what Easter is about for the most part but understanding the true love that the Father has for you that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us and I know that's hard to try and understand how could this God 2,000 years ago die for me right now I hadn't done anything wrong yet but yet that's the kind of God that we serve he's that big that omniscient all powerful he sees the beginning and the end and he knew that once he died on that cross we didn't have to do the whole sacrificial lamb at the altar, which Pastor Dave talked about that the Jewish culture did. He was that lamb once and for all, that man without sin, God, for you and for me, for all mankind. And he did that for each and every one of us. And you, if you have not asked Jesus in your heart to be your Lord and Savior, and you say, I understand and I realize without Him, there's no forgiveness of sin. I, 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 I deserve a life, uh, uh, eternity in hell. That's what it boils down to. But you see, when we accept Him as Lord and Savior, and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I give my life to you. Now that opens up this new life. That's why it's called being born again. This new life where we get to spend eternity with him. You see, because hell was not uh, uh, created or uh, we're not supposed to go there. You see, that was supposed to be for, for 
Lucifer and his angels, not for us. That's not the ultimate plan. But yet, if we say no to God, that's kind of like the default, where we go, that's just the way it works. The choice is ours. Will you accept him today? Because of the cross and the power in the cross. So this altar is going to be open in just a minute. And we can't encourage you enough. If you don't have a, a life surrendered to Jesus, please, please, this time of year, the whole world is looking and celebrating the cross, the, the empty tomb, Easter. Celebrate this, this resurrection Sunday, this Easter Sunday, totally different this year. Going into it, knowing truly what it's all about. And then Pastor Dave talked about love as far as how we are loving one another, understanding Jesus turning everything upside down in the way that they thought and looked at it. We can only do it. We can only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we're gonna end in this way. Can we all stand up? I'm gonna ask the prayer team just to come forward. Be ready to pray for those, especially those that don't know, have not given their life to Jesus. Understanding that every one of us deserve uh, eternity separated from God. But because he came, we can have life. Life to the fullest and eternal life with him. If you don't know the love of Jesus yet, in the Father's love for you. When we pray, please come forward. And the second thing is if you are struggling, or you, forget the word struggling, if you know you need to love more, let's say you love good, but you need to love better. And you're like, Brian, I need prayer for that. Come up, agree with someone, maybe spend time just on your knees worshiping, saying, Lord, reveal those areas in my heart that I'm struggling loving my brother. I'm struggling loving my enemy because Jesus took it that next step for, uh, further. We're supposed to love our enemies. How many of you guys can struggle with that from time to time? My hand's up there. So, Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the power in the cross, the power in the blood that was spilt on Calvary for every single person that has lived and is, is going to live. And Lord, I just pray right now that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you draw each person to you. You draw those that don't know you, those that maybe need to recommit their life to you, Jesus. This Easter season, this Palm Sunday, that they would understand what that cross represents. Father, I pray draw them, draw them close to understand that this simple decision to move forward in surrendering their life to you, committing to their life, their life to you, it'll change their eternity, Father. I pray draw them now, draw them by your Holy Spirit. And Father, those of us that need to do a better job loving, you were the perfect example. You were the perfect example while you were here on earth of how to love your neighbor, how to even love those who crucify you. And you say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. You are a perfect example of that. Lord, I pray that we as a people, we as the church would understand how to love each other and love more of those outside of the walls of this, this building, oh God. Lord, draw us closer to you. Lord, for your Holy Spirit to change us, to reflect you, Father to reflect your love, Jesus. So Lord, draw us closer, draw us deeper. Let your love shine upon us today that we might be a reflection of that love everywhere we go. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. We're just gonna worship this song called Gratitude, just thanking the Lord and singing hallelujah to him. And I just encourage you, come forward. Come forward if you just want to kneel at the altar, if you want a prayer with someone with agreement, or if you need just simple healing today in your body or your marriage or situation going on, we encourage you, come to the altar. And don't forget, if you've not given your heart to Jesus, come up here, make that declaration today and pray with somebody. In Jesus' name, amen.
I've got one response I've got just one move With my arms stretched wide I will worship you So I'll throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a heart fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah oh come on my soul but don't you get shy Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on my soul But don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul, but don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. So that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah. Except 
Singing high.